Welcome to Fintech Impact. This podcast is an exploration of the financial technology world, interviewing different fintech entrepreneurs about what they do, their story, and what their impact is on consumers, incumbents, and the industry as a whole. Here's your host, award-winning financial planner, university lecturer, and writer, Jason Pereira. Welcome to the Fintech Impact Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Today's a little bit of a different episode. Instead of a entrepreneur who's currently working in one business, we have a colleague of mine uh, named Zahir Morali. He is a consultant to many startups and has worked with many technology companies and is one of the more interesting conversations I have on a regular basis about technology, the future, and finance in general. And with that, here is Zahir Morali. Good afternoon, Zahir. Good afternoon, Jason. How are you? Good. Good to have you in. Thank you. Good. So uh, you're a bit of a different uh, conversation. Normally, I'm interviewing entrepreneurs who have like the one company, but you have your hats in a lot of arenas. <laughs> so why don't you give us a little background on what it is you do? Sure. So I uh, spend the bulk of my time working with uh, venture funds and startups in the fintech space and healthcare. So my typical day involves working with venture funds and looking at uh, deals that they might be doing, looking at investments they might be making. Uh, and helping them to improve the operations of their startup companies in their portfolio. The other side of it is actually working with entrepreneurs who run their own startups. So helping them think about how to grow and scale their business, opening up partnership opportunities with them for other companies, and so on. So it's a bit of a mix. It's uh, in part building and growing companies, and another part optimizing operations for uh, relatively new startups. Good. And you've been working with some of Canada's biggest names in this space. I mean, can you share some of those? Sure. In my past, I've worked in a consulting space with a lot of Canada's largest banks and insurance companies. And I've done that both as a consultant and as an operator inside one of Canada's largest banks on the mm-hmm. wealth management side. In the last little while in the startup space with some of the biggest names like uh, Paracorp and Portage. So mm-hmm. their investments in the fintech space and in the healthcare space. And then there's a smattering of other ones that uh, I'm involved with on a daily basis that touch on things like education and retail as well. So there's a fairly broad range of those, but the names are big and they're growing in uh, in terms of their participation in the startup uh, space. So in addition to that, you have kind of your own project that you're working on developing for a platform project you're working on altogether. Yeah. So there is something that we've been working on for the past year. Can't say too much about the specifics, but what we are doing is building out a platform for financial advisors. And we think there are great opportunities to improve both the advisor experience and the client experience uh, at the same time. I think there's been a lot of focus in the industry on the advisor side of tools for a long, long time, and it hasn't had as much impact on the end client. And I Mm -hmm. think there's an opportunity now to bring best-in-class tools together that allow us to improve the advisor experience, but at the same time, uh, dramatically improve the, the client experience. Yeah, flow that through so it's on both levels. Exactly. Agreed. Good. So uh, that's, uh, that's quite a lot. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your past? How did you get to this position? So I spent about seven years out of school in, in the consulting space. So strategy consulting across North America, lots of different industries. So I've done everything from renewable energy to fast food, insurance, uh, healthcare, media companies, so broad range, including mining, uh, et cetera, up in, uh, in Northern Canada. So broad range like that, I then moved into the banking space. So I spent uh, seven years at Scotiabank, the last few of which were in the wealth management space with Scotia McLeod. So a replatform. Yeah, we were there around the same time, weren't we? Uh, we were possibly. Close, possibly. It? Yeah. it was around the same time. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'm other, not sure we ran into each other, but no, uh, no. I would have remembered that. But I, you know, it was it was an interesting time because it was just as we we're coming out of the financial crisis, and there were lots and lots of initiatives underway to change the platform, change policies, and one of the biggest things we were doing was changing what the advisor tool could look like. And so that was a pretty big project for for five years. And then since leaving Scotia, I've been playing uh, a lot in the startup space. So. I've done a lot of big enterprise type clients and client work. And now it's an opportunity to bring some of that skill set, some of that experience down to uh, startups that are trying to either sell to the enterprise space or compete with enterprises. And I think my past experience on the consulting and the operating side allows me to 
to help some of those startups do that more quickly, more efficiently than them trying to hire and bring in the talent uh, themselves. Absolutely. Knowing where, where to shoot and where not to shoot is right. valuable. So yeah, the reason for bringing you in today was, I mean, we've had conversations over probably the last year or so since we got to know each other on countless occasions. And you know, it's always very stimulating. So I thought I'd share that with a larger audience. Sure. But uh, I wanted to talk about larger trends that we're seeing in the fintech space and what we're seeing happening. There's been a lot of money thrown at this area, or area for a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. It's growing rapidly. Toronto's a hub for it. But again, we have hubs all over the world. But there's some giant, some larger underlying trends that we see happening. I mean, the first one I want to talk about is kind of an integration one. Um, piece. So basically everything used to be different or separate and trying to get one system to talk to each other was just not, never going to even happen. And now through the proliferation of APIs, we're in a different world. So you want to speak to what you think about that? I think the place to start is to, is to kind of look back, you know, maybe 10 or, or, or 20 years ago, look at the platforms that were in place at the time in financial institutions. So mm -hmm. if an advisor, and, and you remember this from, you know, starting out in the industry or even hearing stories from people who've been around for a while, they had basically one platform on their desk. They had the computer, they'd switch it on. There was one icon to click on. You clicked on that, you went into the system and it was your trading system. It may have your CRM platform, et cetera, but you, you basically had a phone number for a client. You didn't have... Well, back then it was also DOS-based. Let's, yeah. let's get realistic. So. <laughs> so you were memorizing keystrokes and having to oh, page through screens and that was basically <laughs> the environment, right? It was... You were very fast on it because you memorized all those keystrokes, but it didn't really offer much information. It was screen by screen, page down, et cetera. But it was one system and everyone knew how that operated and everything was bundled in one place. And as we moved along and we went from DOS-based to GUI-based programs, et cetera, we started to see some unbundling of that. We started to see a separate back office system from a trading system. We started to see some separate CRM platforms, early stage CRM platforms. But... By and large, it was all knit together inside one or two applications. What we've seen over the last couple of years now is this tremendous unbundling of the tech stack and mm -hmm. the service stack. So you now have uh, entire companies, entire little startups being set up around optimizing one part of the, the value chain or the workflow for an advisor per client. And what that means now is you get some really great solutions because people are intensely focused on solving one problem. The challenge with that is that problem being solved, it's great, but what you've now done is create another one, which is how do you now stitch together that information together, you know, back again for that client or for that advisor? Because they're now getting point solutions that solve a certain problem, but they're not getting all that information back into one spot. And so you have this unbundling. You have this proliferation of apps like you were mentioning, and mm -hmm. someone's got to go through that and sift and figure out which ones are the best ones to use, which ones are credible, which ones respect your privacy, the security of your data. So there's all those kinds of issues, and there isn't a clear way for people outside of perhaps looking at your top grossing or your top ranked app on an app store. Yeah. There aren't too many ways for people to understand which ones work together, which ones are safe and secure to use. And which ones you should be doing. Yeah, I, I mean, part, we're of the, seeing that. part of the selfish reason for me starting this podcast was I was stumbling upon all kinds of companies that could help my business and slowly integrating them. And most of the time, it was just either hearing it through word of mouth or just stumbling upon an ad or something. So it was the impetus for this was maybe to drive some of that attention my way. So I'd get more, I would be able to spend more time looking for it, but maybe some of these people would start approaching me with their products. So hopefully we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. Cause I think I, I face the same thing where people know I spend time looking at these things. And so they'll come and ask yeah. which app should I use for this? And you know, what should I use for planning or what should I use yeah. for my CRM? And the answer does vary because it depends on your practice and your style, et cetera, Absolutely. but you have to know that piece of it. And I think the other part of this is, you know, a lot of us can stay on top of, the new apps launching, you know, we're on product hunt, we're constantly scrolling to see what's yep. new, but not everyone's going to have time to do that. And no one's going to have the appetite or the interest to do that. No, so and they're constantly evolving. I just had a call today with a product I shot down about two years ago and I looked at it and said, okay, well now you're solving another core problem I have. I'm going to take a very serious look at you. And they, you know, they'll figure out based on their user feedback, how to evolve the product. They may see other opportunities. And so yeah. it's great that people are actually focused on that. Cause I think the big monolithic software companies struggle to stay at the forefront because they've now got this legacy base they have to deal with and they can't go and chase down every new idea, new way of doing things. So it's great that we've got all the startups doing that, but there has to be some way of kind of filtering that back into the ecosystem to say, these are now ripe for use and these mm -hmm. ones still need a bit more time. 
And there needs to sort of filter your mechanism around that and some way to pull all that information back together. And that's the challenge. I mean, one of the things I find that most people have a hard time wrapping their head about, and I've had it before where, clients, where other advisors have asked me, well, you know, what's in your tech stack? And I give them a page and that page is rather long, right? Mm-hmm. And they're just like, oh my God, like how many systems are you using? And it's like, well, this is for my scheduling. This is for financial planning. This is for CRM. Like, so they have their own purpose. It's a matter of, you know, people, the, the days of the one solution to do everything. I mean, that's a nice thought that that could happen, but you're never going to get best in class at anything, right? So I think that that point is incredibly valid. And again, the good thing is, the fantastic thing is, is that the proliferation of APIs allow interchange of information between these different programs and platforms. I mean, without that, we'd be working in dozens of silos. That's absolutely true. But I think at the same time, we have this, this issue of, we tend to take someone who says they've got an API at, at, and, and assume that yeah. yeah assume that it allows that interoperability but it isn't the same thing you know I've yeah. had the experience of the past year of working with all kinds of different vendors and their APIs and it varies so much across yeah. some of them are incredibly useful and open and, and, and lightweight and allow you to do all kinds of things together the, the rest candidly are pretty heavy plucky mm-hmm. uh, tend not to work so they publish it as this mark of you know look we're open and we're evolving and, and etc but it tends to be some of the the larger, bigger enterprises that say they've got that, but then in practice, it doesn't really, really bear out. We've been able to, to do some amazing things in a couple of weeks with some of the startup kind of APIs that we've been able to work with and integrate them into a platform. And then with some of the big incumbents, it's been, you know, two months and we're still barely being able to pass, you know, certain pieces of information. Is that just, you know, what do you think that is? I mean, a lot of them, the ones we're talking about here that are more reluctant are the larger platform players. Part of it, I think, has to be just they're thinking that's going to defend their position, make it harder to switch out. That's something they have to be concerned about, right? But at the same time, is there any other reason you can think of other than just trying to not prioritize that? No, I, I think the cannibalization, the protection of the business is part yeah. of it. I think it's a different way of thinking. Many of these new software stacks you see are basically built as a as a back end with an API to a front end. And so they're structured in a way that their entire application is actually built in that standpoint. Whereas a lot of the legacy apps weren't built that way. Yeah. And so they're having to rebuild the API infrastructure and start. So I think it, it, it does take them more time. It does make it a bit more difficult for them. So they're having to kind of go through those growing pains and they need people experimenting with it to, to identify where there are issues, yeah. but they don't have as much of that going on. And yeah. their, their teams around this area tend to be smaller. They tend to have the bulk of their engineering and talent focus on the core product. Platform. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, they, they're able to check a box. Unfortunately, they're, you know, it's, you have a car. Yes. Well, you have a motorcycle and the other guy's got a Ferrari. So yeah. like, yeah, we, that's you right. know, I've got wheels, but I got wheels. No, yes. no, no sense of what well, kind got, of wheels. Yeah. I've got two wheels. Yeah. Not, so, not four. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, but great. I think it's changing. I think yeah. it is getting better. I think it's moving in the right direction. It's just still a little bit more challenging to work with, with that. And, and hopefully that'll change over the next few months and years mm-hmm. uh, as we go through. Cause I think, the important thing for a lot of the larger companies and companies to understand is that the pace of innovation coming out of these startups around so them rapid. is so fast yep. that they need to figure out ways. I think if you look at the most recent software trends report for financial software in the U.S., you look at T three, yeah, yeah. So you look at that piece, and there are some companies in there, and and I think you know, think about the financial planning space that. Three years ago didn't exist. Yep. Two years ago had maybe two to three percent market share, and today sit close to ten. Yeah, that's right. Um, capital probably yeah. in that case, and I think that's extraordinary yeah. growth. And I think the folks around them ought to be concerned and, and worried about what, what does that mean for their business. And what struck me about this year's um, report was the differences in some of the top ranked players and the changes, the, the degree and change I saw. So, like you're seeing number three players who suddenly are number one over the course of a year, and that's a market share gain of five to ten percent. So that is just frighten anyone in traditional model. Yeah. And I think there are some concerns I have with the survey data itself. The I, I, yeah. So I, you know, I look at it yeah. and go, the directional insights from it, I think are incredibly valuable. Yeah. The, where people are changing and things like that, and the actual percentage numbers, not so fast about that. But I think the directional insights are really good. And I think Absolutely. we put on a couple of them, which is people moving very rapidly, people shifting, people yeah. willing to consider new upcoming applications far more readily than they ever used to. And I think that's true, certainly in the US and the, in the RIA space. Yep. It may be different in the warehouses, and obviously will be. They're bigger. They've got their own kind of programs for how they go through this. But in the independent space, we don't have, have a huge one here in Canada, but I can see that growing. I think that's an interesting, an well, interesting it's, insight. It's interesting the differences in the ecosystem between Canada and the U.S. because when you have a population of advisors that's seventy five percent independent in the U.S., the technological infrastructure and, and the system, the, the vendors that open up to them are just they, they dwarf anything we see in this country. So the challenge is pulling it all together. It's one thing to have all the different apps. In one spot, 
and telling you which ones to get, et cetera. It's another thing entirely to kind of pull all that stuff together. Agreed. Yeah, yeah and I think what you're seeing in the States now, and this is RBC to their credit in the US and not in Canada, because they don't offer this in Canada. And I always say that I wish advisors would go to the US conferences more and see what the Americans have mm -hmm. and come back just demanding better from our institutions, because frankly, we deserve better. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, back to it. RBC in the US put together on the custodial platform something called RBC Black, where essentially they've assembled their preferred vendors and they make sure that they all work harmoniously together. So you have Red Tails of CRM, you have uh, Money Guide Pro as a financial planning software, Risk Alive for risk assessment. And all the tools you would need are literally there off the shelf. Here you go and take it. If you want to use some other financial planning software like eMoney, well, that'll work too. You can integrate it, but then we're not really going to you know, look after that. That's on you. So that I think is a trend you're going to see in the US more. I think you will. And you probably see that here at, at some point as well, where people get some guidance on what things to, to pick. And I think when you have the big institutions stand behind it and say, we're going to support these platforms, it gives you a little bit more confidence that you can mm -hmm. get the right pieces together and that they're trusted. I think, you know, there's two challenges. One is limiting the choice that people have in terms of their experience. It's harder to differentiate yourself if you're doing everything that the guy down the street has. Absolutely. And so it's, it's <laughs> tough. And, and people want to set their experience apart because that's actually what drives the practice in the business. It's funny you say that because one of the things that drives me insane about financial planning software is, is that the lack of ability to customize your reporting, mm -hmm. right? And I've said it before, like I cannot go in with the same financial plan look that everybody else has. I mean, the, all the banks work off and have a plan. I'm working off and have a plan. I've got to be able to, to show differences besides just the text, right? Because the problem is, is that while my plan may be at 10 times better than the guy at RBC, the reality is when they're put in front of them, they look aesthetically the same, right? And that's a problem. And I find it funny in the US, they have the same problem more so on the online space because everybody's moving towards Money Guide Pro, sorry, eMoney mm -hmm. as an online portal. And they all have the same portal. That's right. Right. It all looks the same. And I think sometimes we, we struggle with, I think it's a tough job in terms of regulating industries like this. You know, it, it, I never want to say it's an easy thing. It, it's a very difficult thing to do. But we sometimes take the easy route of mistaking consistency of look mm -hmm. and feel as an indication of quality or that this is met as a threshold. So if it all looks the same and it all looks like this, then the information must all be correct and right to the client, et cetera. And, and those are two very different things. So no. we need to find ways to pull together software, allow for the individuality of the businesses and the firms while having an underlying system that allows us to check the data and make sure the data and Absolutely. the insights are correct. And if that and certifications and all those things are all done correctly. And if that's something we can actually check in the background, then we can allow people to have some different looks and feel that allow that experience to be customized for the client. Because yeah. at the end of the day, one of the major things we're doing with clients is saying, work with me, I'll tailor this to your needs. Well, it can't be that tailored if everybody's producing the same thing for every client and yeah. it all looks the same. That's disingenuous and, and, and yeah. incorrect. I mean, the devil's in the detail of any financial plan, but then on the surface, we, we battle that component, that entire like, oh, wait, this looks very similar to the one I was just received. Right. Yes, but you know, I can sit down and show them the differences and why, but it's a battle I don't need to have no. if it's basically better better presented altogether. So yeah, now you mentioned the, kind of the underlying layer and, you know, basically, so what we're talking about here is essentially having a common out, a common platform where that's the back end, but then the front end is something built over top of that. Now, one of the things, the trends we want to talk about is the trend in blockchain, mm -hmm. right? Now this is of course the hot topic in anything that you mm -hmm. look at, right? I mean, if you add blockchain to your name as a company, your valuation goes through the roof, just like adding an E or a .com did back in right. the 90s. But let's, let's talk about how blockchain is going to change a lot of what happens in the background in this industry. But I think that's, I mean, there are lots and lots of ways in which, you know, when we're seeing this now in terms of all these new companies starting up, et cetera, and you've got tons of startups and uh, initial coin offerings, et cetera, where people are setting up whole new businesses around this infrastructure that's been built. And I think it's important for people to separate the infrastructure of blockchain, what it allows us to do in terms of our ledger and our trusted system yep. versus what has occupied a lot of the media attention for the last little while, which is the kind of currency speculation kind of piece of it. The get-rich-quick so, aspect to it. Interestingly enough, I just read the other day that half of the ICOs from 2017 already broke. Yeah, and there's people who've made a ton of money on it, but we've got a lot of people that are less sophisticated and a lot of people that were asking, yeah. say, last October, about how to get into Bitcoin, how to participate in all these ICOs, and yep. people were going you know, full bore into them, not understanding that they weren't getting any equity. No. They were basically participating in this kind of front end piece of, of, of tokens that would only go up if the underlying business itself would prove to be viable over X and create a market, years, for those and, create a market and, and some scarcity around it. And so a lot of people are going to get hurt in that process. Unfortunately, this is just what happens whenever we encounter a new technology. It goes through these cycles. There's Absolutely. a lot of speculation that pulls in smart money and smart people that drives the innovation forward. Yep. And unfortunately, people do get hurt around the edges. But 
blockchain's here to stay, and the and the underlying technology and what it allows us to do inside financial services and all kinds of other industries is really important. It allows us to reinvent and rethink entire business processes and back offices from where they are today. And up to up till this point, we've never really had much of an alternative. We've had our old approach was more regulation, more process, just throw more people at it. That's it. And, you know, sometimes we would, and I think, you, you know, you've mentioned this before, you know, we've got a compliance and we just throw a whole bunch more compliance people yeah. at it. And we compliance is a growth area and it's basically being handled the exact same way that every other part of this business has been handled. Throw bodies at it, never mind develop the systems. And now you have all these people putting out, dealing with mistakes that if we just had the right process wouldn't exist in the first place. Exactly. It's a lot of exception management where yep. we can use the technology to actually streamline that process Absolutely. and allow us to only flag the exceptions that can be handled and minimize the number of exceptions that come out because everything's being done on the same consistent system around yeah. the country, around North America, around the world, quite frankly, because there's yeah. no reason you couldn't use that same platform globally for managing things like risk, anti-money laundering, profiles, and so on. Across Absolutely. The and it's funny because it, you, you look at it, the big frustration with advisors like myself and those say good advisors in general is that we get treated with the same lens that the bad ones do, right? So the compliance officers are spending as much time on my stuff reviewing things as they are on someone who may be trying to screw over their clients, right? Mm -hmm. And frankly, it's partially because of the system being broken in the way that it is, right? If we had the number of times we get documents back because, oh, this initial was missed on page 13 of God knows how many pages. It's ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. And this is something that someone's passed through multiple people's hands and eyes and then had to come back for more work. Meanwhile, our friends at Well Simple and other robo advisors, mm -hmm. that can't possibly happen because they built the system on the front end whereby you can't even progress until you've made sure all the signatures are there. So therefore, there's never going back. Yeah, it's just rethinking the process from the from the ground up. And it's it's, Absolutely. it's difficult sometimes in a large incumbent organization to do that, but mm -hmm. not impossible. And I yeah. think what this allows us to do is to take a step back and rethink our entire processes with blockchain in mind. So if we approach this with the right mindset, which is look, this is going to be an investment area for a decade, it's going to take investment and constant work to kind of improve yep. and pull this together, then I think we can approach it with a, with a view, which is if we want to get this right, then let's look at core underlying processes from the ground up using this technology and allowing us to be more nimble. So we know it's moving so rapidly. We need it to be uh, more flexible in the moment. Absolutely. And I mean, I, you know, it's people often say like, oh, it's like the 1990s all over again with the dot com. But when there's some truth to that, but I think we're at the earlier stage and the later stage of the 90s. And that's for sure. And, you know, when people make that claim about how much money they can make, it's like, well, how, many, how much money got lost? And right. frankly, would you have chosen an online bookstore to end up to be the most powerful company in the world based on what was going on? Like, it, I didn't, I mean, we, we didn't think books would exist. Anymore. Like, you yeah, know, that's a thing. Like, know. We, didn't, we didn't think that at all. And it, you look at where they started, right? Picking off Absolutely. a core process that was broken, picking off one thing. And I think there's a ton of value to be gained with that focus and picking up one problem to, to work on and then expanding that piece. And we've yeah. seen that successfully with a whole bunch of other people. I think this is one of those where we find the right applications to do this. And that might be around identity and it yep. might be around transaction monitoring and so on. We'll find ways to pull that together, but it'll, it'll require some long-term horizon thinking by some of the biggest companies around it is because that's where you're going to get the value in these transactions it's not necessarily going to come from the smallest startup that doesn't have the same no. customers the complications and all those things as part of no it. i mean the reality is is that to be the low-hanging fruit in this industry when it comes to blockchain is settlement of transactions I and mean, that's that's pretty much what it was almost developed for essentially and you look at the situation we're in now with t plus three and moving into t plus two taking how many years to implement it's ridiculous i mean literally with you know you get the right, right blockchain infrastructure in place and you're literally t plus a couple minutes yeah that, and, and it, mean, it means transaction volume and speeds have to increase absolutely substantially from where they are today like yep. orders of magnitude faster than where they are today yeah. but that can come but at least we have the tool set now right. for it in order to validate that that's right yeah. and the, you know it's everything it's it's the learning infrastructure the exchanges yeah. all those pieces that we need because you could see entire exchanges and marketplaces yeah. built entirely on this piece so whether it's allowing us to now invest globally across yeah. multiple stock exchanges multiple geographies and trade around the world using a platform like this, which today That's would the be almost impossible. Let's talk about the smaller vision, okay? You know why you can't transfer money between people in the U.S. or, or between banks in the U.S. and Canada on weekends? Because the servers are not open on weekends. The servers are not open. No, I swear to God. I remember listening to some Planet Money. They talked about the infrastructure in the U.S. and literally the servers, for the servers where the, all this is run through, where all the centralized clearing happens, 
They just, keep bankers hours. Oh. <laughs> so when, in the sixties, when they thought about this, they're like, oh, well, you know what? We, no, no, no. We have to be at the golf course by whatever day. So yeah. So well, they need a rest too. Yeah. So. so that's, that's the level of sh the shift in thinking that has to happen. Like yeah. literally we're not dealing with 1980s thinking. We're dealing with 1960s thinking in some right. way. But you know what? I think that what excites me about it is that it provides us with the true underlying infrastructure for what is necessary to make all that come to fruition. Yeah. We didn't have that before. No, we didn't. And I think a lot of us don't understand. And I think that it, it's still something, oh, yeah. you know, a lot of us don't understand how how this actually works. I think until you actually try it and test it out and spend a little bit of time doing it, it's, it's tough to really imagine how this will change your world as an advisor. And whether it changes, you know, as an advisor in terms of the work that you're doing day to day or changes your world as an advisor in terms of the other things you do outside of your day to day work that mm -hmm. are going to be influenced by this. Real estate's going to be influenced by this. There's absolutely so entire other industries, education, so many other well, ones that I was, actually change with this. I've already had conversations about using smart contracts surrounding uh, financial planning, mm -hmm. specifically to create accountability on advisor actions and client actions, right? So That's every great. advisor's had the situation whereby the client comes and you, says, you said I would be at this point by this amount of time, right? And I'm not there. Well, who's responsible for that? I mean, the markets are one thing and typically the blame goes to the markets, but the advisor had a series of actions that had to be filled out based on the financial plan. The client had a series of actions, including funding the account to the tune that they said they were. And what's tracking that right now, it's the advisor doing sweat equity at this point to try to figure it out, right? If we have a smart contract where basically the financial plan gets stamped and suddenly, and it's properly hooked up with the other systems, well, the client decides not to make his RSP contribution that year, he's in violation of the contract. And then the ability to then take that and say, look, we need to adjust the plan based on this. Exactly. So it feeds into that evolution of the plan. The plan actually becomes a living document, which is yeah. something we've always called it, but it's never, never actually in practical it's reality been. being a living document. No. It's... Um, it actually can become that. You and can't I think be a living document a, if, you're, if you're paper. Like, this right. is the reality of it. I mean, my, you know, the dream has always been for a system, an overall system that basically is going to track your financial plan in real time. And as adjustments need to be made uh, to the actual plan itself, you can do it, have a conversation, bam, and you're, now you're on the new, right. the new path. And this actually allows, you know, back to the point we made earlier, which is the ability for this back-end infrastructure to be tested true make sure the regulators are comfortable with everything that's going in there, but allows you to vary the front end to tailor it to the customer's needs, whether it's a printed PDF version or yep. it's an online portal version or something on their mobile phone for an app. Yep. It allows you to customize the look and feel of that for how they want it while yep. still maintaining that integrity and trust at the at the contract level for that plan. Well, and, the, and the great news is these experiments are happening, right? Like I know of projects in the U.S. where they're testing large open ledgers to basically settle transactions of, of investments, right? Like this is all hypothetical right now because they're not actually turning it on a marketplace, but literally being able to execute a trade and have the entire thing settled like basically within a couple minutes compared to the, the current living, the world we live in right now, it's insane. Like you said, orders of magnitude and difference. Orders of magnitude in terms of speed, orders of magnitude in terms of the infrastructure you need, to prove and to, to, to trust the transaction. Absolutely. Like the number of parties that are involved yep. that have to kind of countersign and, 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 and so on on this. I think that's where you start to see, you know, things will free up resources. Mm -hmm. It'll free up and make things a little bit less expensive than they are today. Absolutely. It'll create some different jobs and different opportunities for people in terms of how they, they go about their day. But I think it's one of the most exciting things that we have. I think the challenge right now is separating the hype of uh, the currency yeah. from the underlying incredible technology that's that's. that's I, I often say part of me really hates Bitcoin but loves blockchain and yeah. it's because I don't like the greed aspect of it. I like the underlying promise. I like the underlying potential and I think that this entire, you know, Bitcoin getting to, two, was it 20,000? No, yep. Was such a distraction yes. from the underlying potential of this, right? And do I think it's going to survive as a currency? I probably, I do. I, I do believe that. Maybe I'm wrong, but nevertheless, the reality is, is that it's, we're just all focused on making a quick buck. And that's what everybody's doing. Like no one's actually, like, like you know how many bad companies are getting funded through ICOs? And it's interesting because it's having shockwaves everywhere because even investment bankers are now saying they're having a hard time finding deals to make because it's just too easy to get dumb money, quote That's unquote, right. through ICOs at and this point. And I think point. a lot of people see that as, you know, potentially being a way we will continue to fund companies in the future. I think there yep. just needs to be, there isn't a lot of structure. There's no regulation at this point. Market. Exactly. So that's the challenge today. A lot yeah. of people are going to get burned by it. But as a credible funding mechanism, yes. I mean, it's arguably no different to what people would have been doing for the past five or 10 years, whatever it is on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Yeah. 
you're asking a crowd to help fund the platform yeah, program. But this time you're so selling on. the Chuck E. Cheese tokens as opposed That's to selling right. a T-shirt. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. No, it's, it is what it is. I mean, it's, the potential there is incredible. So I want to come back to the advisor space again and start talking about some of the things we're seeing happening, specifically in the in the automation of workflows and whatnot. I mean, like it's been really slow in Canada and the U.S. Look at the CRM products they have down there, like, like Redtail or Juncture or Wealthbox. And the ability to basically say, if this, then that, and create a workflow start to finish mm -hmm. is leading to efficiency gains that we have yet to see up here. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think you've got platforms like Zapier and others that allow you to yep. plug different applications together. So it's not only within applications like Redtail, et cetera, that you're seeing that. And I think Salesforce is another one that's got some components in, in their platform around that. I think what's interesting is the ability to use platforms that are outside the kind of core ones that you're using to to glue things together across them. So Absolutely. I think we'll see that. I think what it does, though, the interesting thing is it allows for more efficient practice. It allows you to set up a practice that is more automated, better service for clients, fewer things that drop between the cracks, and allows people to set up infrastructure in, in a world where real estate is getting expensive and benefits and, and yep. all those sorts of things. And candidly, I think in a lot of cases, in especially in the financial services industry, not as many new entrants, not as many people no. wanting to enter the industry. So we're constrained for resources. And I think what some of these platforms allow us to do is deal with the fact that there aren't that many people coming in. People well, we can talk about the problems so about the reason for that. I mean, that's our own fault. That's our own fault on a lot of levels. Yeah. And I think it is. And I don't know if that's going to change in the near term, given what we see happening yeah. when you talk about, and I think you mentioned this before when we were chatting was, you know, things in Australia, things in the UK, a lot of the programs, a lot of the progress yeah. that's happening in the industry continues to weed people out more than attract new well, people. Interestingly enough, the growth right now, what's actually happening in the UK is since their change is the number of advisors is actually growing. And I think with the UK's, what's happening recently in Australia, where they're trying to put in these proficiency standards for education and for certification. And if you don't meet them, then you've got a set amount of time before you have to meet them and then you're gone. That includes having to take an undergraduate degree if you don't have one. Mm -hmm. The reality is, is that one of the big holdbacks in this industry is the lack of a very determined career path. Right, like you want to be a lawyer, you know what your career path is. You do undergrad, you go to law school, you go article, you work as a um, an intern. What's the term they have it for? An associate, mm -hmm. and then eventually become partner. Like there is a clear set career path. If you don't go that route, you can go independent. What is our career path? Like what leads into financial planning and that's, financial? Yeah, that's you know it's it's a fair point. I think it's more flexible in that sense. But it I is. think you know in a world to where people government. want to be told a little uh, bit more about what they need to do. Not everyone deals with ambiguity well. Not everyone no. deals with you know lack of structure. So I think you're right in the sense that people are looking for direction in terms of what to do. And so I think the, the regulations will help. I think what you saw happen in the UK was this really big change structurally. A lot of people left the industry and yeah, now about picking a third. up again, right? So yeah. and I think here without those kinds of programs, I see sort of slow attrition out of the industry rather than any kind of big wholesale change. Yeah. So unless we see some really big changes policy wise, we'll probably just see the slow attrition. And what it means is that advisors are going to have to just get better at managing practices with fewer people. They're going to have to get more efficient and the tools are going to need to evolve to allow them to run practices, even down to solo practices. Yeah. And this They're is what we've been, talking about. we've been yeah. talking about, that, the, the, the future of the solo advisor, which is actually back in the day, it was almost, you haven't built scale, you mm -hmm. know, you're, not, you're too small to actually hire people. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Whereas now with all the tools that are available to us and a solo advisor can be as, as efficient as a four person team before. Right. And it creates opportunities for people who are associates on teams who look to transition and want to be on their own. And, you know, before would have thought like, how am I going to set this whole thing up? Well, now I can go out and do it on my yeah. own. And so that's, that's actually positive yeah. for people that are looking to be entrepreneurial. At the same time, it's great for people that look at their current practice and realize that the old benchmarks of how many people I have on my team and all those things yeah, were outmoded yep. things. Like we were doing that because of the tools and infrastructure we had. Well, we don't have to do it that way anymore. Exactly. And we can focus on the right set of clients doing the right processes with the right set of tools and run a better, more efficient practice that allows you to leave at the time you want to leave and not have to worry about team of 10 or whatever it is. But it also creates opportunities for other people that want to strike out on their own and do that. Because if, yeah. if you're running an efficient practice, you don't have to make as much to afford everything Absolutely. to do with your office. I mean, this is the thing is the badge of honor in Canada is to have like hundreds of millions or a billion of dollars, like let's call it a billion dollars mm -hmm. now under management. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is that that's great. But the profitability that you're seeing is the equivalent of someone who's running an efficient independent practice of two to 300 million. I would strongly encourage any advisors to this to do a really quick exercise, which is just take your T4 over your gross yep. and look at that because, and, and compare that if you can across your peers, colleagues that run different practices, because I think you find a lot of people don't do that. 
No. And a lot of people don't understand that what looks like a big profitable practice because of how much growth, et cetera, is in there, actually at the end of the day, it doesn't run very efficient, doesn't actually create a lot of netting. No, we have, that. we have had this, I mean, we both have been at major brokerage firms, right? We know the world there. And in Canada, in the U.S., everything we're talking about in terms of independence and that entrepreneurship, that is very true in the U.S. 75% of the market is, is RIAs and growing and to the point where large wirehouses like Merrill Lynch were net negative new assets last year in a growth market. So that's insanity to them. But that's because people are not seeing the benefit of the large wirehouses. Welcome to Canada where it is the exact opposite. And the problem is, is that yeah, I talk to the average advisor about you know when you run an independent like investment planning council or some of the new ones like online, and they look at you cross-eyed like, where are you? This can't have any credibility, right? Because they have blinders on. To the best of their knowledge, there's five different associations, associations, five different companies to work for. And if you want to go independent, it's the more traditional looking independents like the Raymond Jameses of the world, the Can Accords, and the uh, Richardson GMPs, right? The alternatives, I mean, like. When I, when I compare grids to these guys, they, their eyes jump out of their heads. They're giving up a best case scenario, 50 cents in the dollar, and then paying some of their expenses themselves. You look at some of the newer startups where you have essentially like flat fee arrangements whereby mm-hmm. you're paying $35,000 for dealership services, and then you pay for whatever technology you want on top of that, right? Those types of anyone who is an entrepreneur who basically sees the, can sees the light on that and realizes, I don't need to run a billion dollars. I can run 200 million and make the same kind of money. It is, it is a very and, different And we are experience. seeing compression, right? So we, we are going to see, and it, it's, it's, not a, it's not a trend that's going to turn around anytime soon. We are seeing compression on what clients are willing to pay and what fees they should be charged and yeah. what set of service, like the service pool and portfolio expands and the price they're willing to pay for it gets compressed. And we're going yeah. to continue to see that. So I think it's, it's going for every advisor, look at their practice and think about how to run this more efficiently so I can still provide a great level of service to those clients. Yeah. And allow them to pay a little bit less yeah. because I know that's the writing on the wall for all of us. And it's hard to do that when you're paying 50 points for the logo on your yes. card. The reality is, is that, yeah, and, and I'll tell you, the, the, fee, the, shoe, the shoe that's dropped already is it pricing on product, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, your ETFs are as cheap as they're going to get probably or make, still get slightly cheaper. Mm-hmm. Mutual fund companies are all taking haircuts to basically com- price competitively. Advisor comp has not really wavered much. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you can make the argument that in the anyone who was doing DSC compared to doing fee-based now is making less. That's fine, but that was a change that was needed <laughs> That needed, happen. Yeah. But you know, you have advisors who move to portfolio management platforms solely to basically to get the 1.5 as opposed to the one. Uh, I know there's many of them who've done that. But sooner or later, that advisor comp is going to start seeing compression. And if you look at the US, one of the fastest growing segment of the US market is the retainer based model, right? right? Basically, you're paying an upfront of a couple hundred bucks and then you're paying a couple hundred bucks per month to stay on with that advisor. And, you know, XY Planning Network's built their entire structure out of that. And, yeah. and I think I think we will. I think we'll see some of these different models emerge. And, you know, it, it's I know people way doing too it early here to see. Yeah, way too early to see which yeah. ones will, will, will win. And maybe there is room. I think that, that this is probably true. There is room for different kinds of models. So Absolutely. clients that are willing to just look, just charge me a flat percentage, whatever. And I'm, you know, that's yeah. it. And I, that's what I'm used to and I'm comfortable with. But then others saying, look, I don't need that. Yeah. I'm more willing to do a really low percentage rate on the fee, the investment side, yeah. and then on demand for advice. Exactly. So I would love to pay you your 500 bucks an hour or 300 bucks an hour, whatever that number turns yeah. out to and be. And then I'll pay the Netflix fee. On demand. Yeah. yeah. That's Monthly right. ne- Netflix fee. I get access to you when I need you. That's it. Yeah. yeah. number of hours. And so I can see different models. And I think it's, it's going to be interesting to see how they all play yeah. out because for so long, everything around this industry has been tied to the product. Exactly. People have been... Uh, consumers have been unaware about what they've actually been paying for in terms of that investment advice. Yeah. And I think the fact that we're now separating those things and, you know, again, disaggregating this piece is great. It'll create the conditions again, like we're seeing on the tech and the software side, it'll create those conditions again for clients, which is, okay, but how do I pull this all back together again? So you've disaggregated product and service fees and admin yeah. fees, and then maybe I'm now paying for statements or not paying for statements, and yeah. maybe I have to pay for a client portal or not. I don't know, but at the end of the day, who's going to help pull that back together and say, okay, and by the way, when you add all this stuff up, you're paying more, less than, same as, or yep. whatever compared to before. Was it Paul Graham or Mark Andreessen who said, the only way to make money is to unbundle and rebundle things. Right. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we're definitely in the unbundling phase yep. and that gives us a lot of power. So that's that's fantastic. But yeah, no, uh, it's it's a trend that I think is going to basically, I hope catches fire north of the border. And I already know people doing that retainer-based model. And I've never believed in this in concept of the advice gap, that, that if we change the structure of compensation there's going to be this entirely underserved market you know what maybe that was a concern back when the uk made their changes but now we have the robo advisors of the world mm-hmm. now we have new models like we have other uh non 
ETF-based mutual fund companies that basically offer service on demand and go direct to consumer. We have advisor, we have entrepreneurship. That's what it comes down to. If someone is willing to pay for a service and has a need, someone will figure out a price point at which they can deliver that. Now, it may be the lowest common denominator product, but it's something. I think, I mean, arguably we have an advice gap today that exists because We've got institutions raising their minimums on where, yep. you know, you know, in terms of you know, where you can be with the full service brokerage side. That's right. That's leaving a, a gap for people who say, look, I don't necessarily want to be with the one institution out of the bank branch. That relationship changes every year, two years or whatever it is. Absolutely. I want a consistent relationship with somebody. I don't have enough to qualify for what the minimums are. In the, so where is that person going? Where, where do they get advice and, and, and who's their right person? I think there is this growing gap. Yep. There's this gap already. And the independents are the folks who actually fill that. Yeah. And I think we need access to more people like that. I think we need to make it easier for people to set up, shop, certified, et cetera, like do all the right things, but their ability to yeah. actually set up shop and have the right tools and platform and structure behind them to yeah. serve more people. Because I think if we continue this, this path, we're going to end up with more and more people that feel marginalized and either have to go down the zero advice route, which is not great for them because this isn't, what they set yeah. up where they actually want advice or somehow trying to claw on and hang on to that advisor that yeah, now and moving overpaying up. that rate and overpaying that rate. And yeah. I think there's, there's this gap in the hey. market and I think there's a great opportunity for the independent advisor with the right tools, platform structure. And that's my concern. The industry structure in Canada is not really conducive to it yet, no. right? It's getting there. We're making, yeah. we're making inroads, but they're slow. I mean, look at the U S like I said, go back to the example. You want to be an advisor, go to the FPA conference. You got your CFP, you got all that. You're leaving your big wirehouse firm. And 20 grand is a startup cost. Yeah. Like you can get RA in a box to set you up for like five grand. You get discretionary control over your portfolios. You can pick whatever you want and everything scales. The, the costs are low. They all have packages that basically the more you have, the more you pay. So you are scaling right along. They're scaling right alongside you. Right. And, and the benefit they've always had has been a, a far more uh, competitive and fragmented banking yeah. sector and, and, and wealth sector yeah. than we've ever had. And I think it's always created the conditions for people to move around and have multiple options in terms of their advice. And I think here we've got five generally. Yeah. People. Well, and once we let the five, thing, pil- right? once the pillars basically merge, yeah. that was the end of it, right? Because then everything consolidated at the bank level, right. right? When in reality, that was probably, when you look at the ecosystems in the US and Canada, I will argue that was a mistake. Right? Yeah, but probably. And you know, maybe it's part of this, this cycle that we keep talking about, which is, happens across industries, which is yeah. this bundling and rebundling that the pendulum swings, right? Yeah. So maybe we're on for this next round of unbundling of services in, in like not just the tech stack, but the actual services and, and, and offerings available. Mm-hmm. So we're going to see this unbundling of components, whether it's lending and credit and wealth management and, and banking and so on. And we've seen that with all sorts of startups out there. Absolutely. Uh, and borrow wells and all those people around. Yep. And maybe, you know, the, the challenge again is for the consumer to have to pull it up again. So if you end up doing this, if you as a consumer decide, Hey, look, I actually want better service and better tools. I'm going to go put some money here or borrow money from a different startup and, and, and so on, a different company. I've now got to stitch all that together. Yep. So, you know, it was great when I could go to one portal and see everything, but now I've got to go to four or five or six. And that's a challenge, I think, for a lot of, it's a, it's a it roadblock is. for a lot of people. It is. It holds me that. back from using certain solutions at this point. Yeah. But I mean, you look at, I mean, we talked about it, the, the solo advisor and the amount of the, you, leverage we're getting. I mean, it's just, I'm ashamed to say that my, that the person in charge of booking all our meetings, she was spending 60 to 70% of her time booking meetings. And once I heard that number, I'm like, okay, that has to end. So right. sign up for schedule once. And yeah. suddenly like the amount of time she's spending on my meetings has been cut down to 10% of that right. because there's always the people who are going to not respond to email mm-hmm. or the people who are too old to respond to email. Right. And I've so, used, uh, you know, and, and it doesn't have, even have to be that. I, I've used a virtual assistant for the last year. Yeah, so apps, that's great. it's been great because that interaction happens all over email. It's so good to the point that most people think that my assistant's actually real and, yep. and live and want to talk to it on the phone, but it's not. And it just, it saves me a ton of time Absolutely. Uh, going back and forth and doing those meetings. But it adds, it still adds something of a personal touch to that interaction yep. without it being something where you go and book something on a on Absolutely. A, on a scheduler. And I think people still value some of those, those pieces. Yeah. It's a delicate balance between the the automated versus the human interaction, right? And the, the, the message is, and with that statement on Clara, is very simple that it doesn't have to be one or the other. You can actually have both. So, so here, this has been fantastic. Thank you very much for this. I'm sure everyone's going to love this interview. I may have to get you back at some point soon. That's great. But uh, thanks again. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that was my interview with Zahir Morali. I hope you enjoyed that. He and I tend to uh, have conversations like that every time we get together. So it's always very heady, very interesting, and always talking about the future and very little about the present. So uh, with that, thank you for joining us on FinTech Impact, and uh, I'll see you next time.
This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at fintechimpact.co.